That brings us to the section on transportability of causal effects across populations. So far in this course, we've only looked at identifying and estimating causal effects within one population. But say we know the causal effect in one population, we want to know if it's the same or if we can somehow use that information to transfer, transport, and then get the causal effect in a different population. So more specifically, here's the transportability problem. We have a source population, pi, and a target population, pi star. We'll denote the distribution for the source population as p, and the distribution for the target population as p star. And we'll consider that we maybe are given p of y given do t comma x, so some interventional distribution in population pi. So we might have done some experiments to get that distribution. And then we're interested in the corresponding estimate in the target population. So importantly, there's a star here, p star of y given do t comma x. So how can we identify this estimate given, say, observational data, p star, and given interventional distributions from the source population, and also given observational data from the source population, say? For example, is it the case that these two quantities are equal? Under what assumptions would this be true? Or if they're not equal, how might we be able to identify this p star quantity? Where identify in this setting will mean that we remove all do operators from terms that have a star in them. So it's okay if there's a do operator for p without a star, because we're saying we're given access to that, right? We've done experiments in population pi. And it's okay if we have a star in terms that don't have a do operator, because we're saying that we have access to the observational data in the population pi star. So that's the transportability problem. And then a very important set of objects that we have to introduce are selection diagrams. So you might remember that in the previous section on transfer learning, we saw that we assumed that the causal mechanisms were the same across the two distributions, p train and p test, which in this case is like p and p star. But in selection diagrams, we'll see how we can allow for different causal mechanisms across the two distributions. So here's an example of a selection diagram. We have a regular causal graph where we have nodes X, T, and Y, and then we have a selection node S, which we put in a square to make it clear that it's a selection node. It's different from a regular node in the graph. And the fact that S has an arrow to X means that the causal mechanism that generates X can be different between the two distributions, P and P star. So for the two populations, pi and pi star, the mechanisms that generate the data for these populations can differ for x. We can have more than one selection node. So for example, we could have one for t here as well, which means that we're allowing that the mechanism for t differs between the p and p star distributions. Similarly, we could have this one as well. If this is the case, we actually are assuming nothing in common between the P and P star distributions, right? We're assuming that the mechanisms for any of the variables can be completely different across the two distributions, the two populations. So that clearly seems like it'd be a problem. So in general, we're going to need to assume that the mechanisms are the same for some of the variables. In this case, we'll just look at where the mechanisms are the same for T and Y. And note that when we exclude these S nodes, these selection nodes, that encodes an assumption of invariance. We're assuming that the mechanisms for variables that don't have selection nodes pointing to them, these mechanisms are invariant across the two distributions, P and P star. So just like in regular probabilistic graphical models or causal graphs, the absence of edges denotes assumptions. And then the way we'll write p star is by just conditioning on this s star node. So p star of y given do t come x is the same thing, but now we don't have a star here. It's just p of y given do t of x. And now this star, we've removed it and put it over here, where we're conditioning on s star, right? To denote this distribution, we are conditioning 
this variable to be equal to s star. All right, so with selection diagrams introduced, we can get into transportability, and we'll start with direct transportability. This is often what people mean when they talk about external validity. So we have external validity, say, if the causal effect that we're interested in in one population, so this is in this distribution p, is the same as the causal effect in another population, where we're here we're looking at p star for the pi star population in contrast to the pi population here. We want to know if these two quantities are equal, right? In other words, we want to know if we have external validity of the experiments that we might have done to get access to this interventional distribution. And it turns out that these are equal under this assumption. So the assumption here is that y is deseparated in the graph where we've removed incoming edges to t, because we've intervened on t here, from s, so y is deseparated in that graph, from s, conditional on t and x. So in this graph here, we have y, and we want to see if it's deseparated from s, and this graph where we could imagine removing this edge and removing this edge. And it turns out that y is deseparated from s because this path from s to y is blocked by x, and then any other path is blocked because we've removed this edge going into t right here. And that's because we're talking about do t. So this is known as direct transportability because we have the exact same causal effect in one population, pi, is equal to the causal effect in another population, pi star. We've directly transported that causal effect from one population to another. In other words, the experiments in population pi are externally valid in the sense that they transport, they transfer, to another population, pi star, under the assumption that the way they defer, the way that their distributions defer, follows this, right? The only way they defer is in the air, is in their causal mechanism for x, how x is generated. That can be different between the two distributions, p and p star. And the proof for this equality, given this deseparation statement, is fairly simple. So first, we just rewrite this p star term. As we showed, we could rewrite it on the previous slide. Then, since we have deseparation between y and s, and then we have y and s here, we can just remove the s, right? So this is just rule one of do calculus, if you remember that. But really, you can just think of it as there not being association flowing from s to y when we've conditioned on x in this graph where there's no edges going into t. So because there's no association flowing from s to y, when we have the variable that we care about is y and s has no association flowing to it, then s is irrelevant, so we can just drop it. So that's the sort of graphical intuition for that, if you remember. But then there's rule one of Duke calculus that we've applied here. But what if we have that the mechanism for y is different between the two distributions? We have a selection node over y. Then we don't have direct transportability. However, in this graph, we do have a different thing known as trivial transportability, right? So remember, we don't have direct transportability, but then remember that we do have access to observational data from the target population, right? We can sample from p star. And in this graph, we can identify the estimate that we're interested in using only target data. We don't need to use data from the original population or the experiments that we saw in the original population, pi, not pi star. So this is because in this graph, the quantity that we're interested in is y, p star of y given do t comma x. So we've conditioned on x, so we've blocked this backdoor path. And because we've blocked this backdoor path, then we can just drop the do operator, right? This is just the backdoor adjustment or rule two of do calculus. And this is known as trivial transportability. We have trivial transportability when the quantity we're interested in, here this quantity, is identifiable only using data from that distribution, from the p star distribution. So we haven't had to use this interventional distribution in population pi, right? We haven't had to use this distribution p at all, where we actually do have access to interventional data to identify this quantity that we care about, right? This quantity was trivially transportable. We could just identify it with observational data from that population. Okay, but then what if we 
don't have trivial transportability either. So say we're interested in identifying p star of y given do t in this graph. So we don't have trivial transportability because there's this unobserved compounder u, and we don't have direct transportability because there's this backdoor path through x, but we can probably combine aspects of trivial and direct transportability to get an identification result here. For that, we'll introduce the concept of S admissibility. A set of variables, W, is said to be S admissible if Y is deseparated from S given T and W in the graph where the incoming edges to T are removed. Right, so if we have an S admissible set W, that means that that set W will block all paths between S and Y. It will make it so that no information can flow from S to Y, which means that S is irrelevant for Y. And since S is the selection node here, it's the node that, the, that denotes the difference between our different populations, that means that whichever population we care about is irrelevant here, right? S is independent of Y. So if we have an S admissible set W, then we get this following transportability result. This result says that we can identify p star of y given do t, right? So this is something that we don't have direct access to because we only have observational data for p star. We can identify this by summing over all values that the admissible set can take on. And then inside the sum, we have p, not p star, of y given do t comma w. And since this is just p, not p star, and we've assumed that we do have access to these interventional distributions, or we've done these experiments in population pi, we have access to this factor, and then we have access to this factor, p star of w, because this is just observational data that we've assumed we have access to. So this result is saying that we can transport some causal effect from population pi, right? That's, this is a causal effect in population pi, to a causal effect in population pi star, if we have S admissibility, and then we have access to the marginal of the S admissible set in the population pi star distribution, then we just use this distribution to transport the causal effect from population pi to pi star, right? It's this sort of fine tuning that we're doing to change it from one population to the other. And this looks just like the backdoor adjustment, in fact, Another word for sufficient adjustment set from week four is admissible set. So we had admissible sets back then, which we used to adjust, and that this is just the backdoor adjustment, but without the stars, if you remove the stars, then you have the backdoor adjustment, but with these stars, we have this transportability adjustment. Anyway, so back then, we had an admissible set, W, right, that's without the stars, and then here for transportability, when we have these stars, we have an S admissible set. And you can see that in this graph, we do have an admissible set. So if we just take X, just the singleton set of X, that is an admissible set. So we have that Y is independent of S if we condition on X here in the graph where we removed the edges going into T. Then S will be deseparated from Y. So X is an admissible set for this selection diagram. And this all comes from a paper from Pearl and Berenboim in 2014. That brings us to the end of the transportability section and to these three questions. The first is describe direct transportability in your own words. The second is describe trivial transportability in your own words. And then finally, for the transport result that you saw on the previous slide, go ahead and prove that result. And with that, we've reached the end of this lecture. Yashua Bengio will be giving the next lecture in my place on the topic of causal representation learning. So you can think of that as learning the exact representation for the variables of the graph. And that lecture will show up in the causal inference course lectures playlist. So if you're used to watching lectures on the full lectures playlist, it's not going to be in that playlist. You'll have to check out the other playlist, the causal inference course lectures playlist. 
but you won't have to worry about that if you're subscribed and if you hit the bell icon next to the subscribe button as then you'll just get notifications about whenever I upload new lectures. So make sure to check out that next lecture on causal representation learning from Yashua. And thanks for watching.